Today we're going to talk about a system of first order differential equations, linear differential equations. Um, so here we have n unknown functions and we write that their first order derivatives are equal to some functions of the other functions and themselves and possibly the independent variable t. But we're going to focus on especially simple ones where we have right now a constant coefficients and we're only going to be dealing with uh, to unknown functions. So let's first see how these fun these might naturally arise in problems. So suppose we have second order differential equation, which we already know how to solve. It's homogeneous constant coefficient. So we know how to solve this. And we know that we can write down a characteristic polynomial for this differential equation and solve for the roots. And then we see we have a general solution. But if you have a you can always take a single differential equation and rewrite it as a system of first order differential equations. So let's see how to do that. So we're going to let x1 equal to y. And we're going to then let x2 <coughs> equal to y prime. And we're going to treat these as, I mean, they're obviously related, x1 and x2. They're derivatives of one another. Or, uh, x2 is a derivative of x1. But we're going to treat them as if they were two different functions. So let's notice that x1 prime is y prime, but y prime is x2. Now let's look at x2 prime. That's equal to y double prime. I look at the differential equation, and you can see that you can isolate y double prime on one side, bring all the other business to the opposite side. So we know that y prime is times y plus 2 times y prime, but y is equal to x1 and y prime is we define that to be x2. So what we've done is that we've rewritten the second order differential equation as a system of first order differential equation. And we can think of this of course all these and this x1 and x2 they're both functions of the independent variable t. And then we can write this because we have constant coefficients as a matrix equation, a matrix differential equation. The idea is that we can develop methods for solving such an equation, uh, and we only really have to do with for, deal with first order derivatives instead of the second order derivative. And the secret is that the solutions to this equation is going to have to do with this matrix. It's going to deal with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And uh, even though we won't be dealing with more than uh, just two a system of two differential equations and two unknown functions. Let's go ahead and see how we can use this to maybe rewrite a second, a third order differential equation to see how this generalizes to, to higher order uh, differential equations. So suppose we have, if we can rewrite this as a system of first order differential equations. We would let x1 be y x2 be y prime, and we would let x3 be y double prime. Okay, so now let's see what we get. x1 prime is y prime, but y prime is x2. We get x1 prime is equal to x2. Next, x2 prime is y double prime, but y double prime is x3. Okay, and finally, x3 prime is y triple prime then we can solve for y triple time, that is to say isolated by itself on one side and bring all the business to the opposite side. So y triple prime is 5y plus y prime minus 2y double prime. But y is x1, y prime was defined to be x2, and y, y double prime is x3. So we can say that x3 prime is 5 times x1, plus x2 minus 2 times x3. You see here we have a system for our third, differ, uh, third order differential equation. We wrote an equivalent system of three first order differential equations. And so maybe if we, we learn how to deal with a system of first order differential equations, we can then deal with any uh, higher order differential equation. You can also write this as a matrix equation. 
And then again, the solutions for the X's will have to do with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. Okay, so let's just look at a system of two differential equations. So let's call the two unknown functions X and Y. The derivatives are going to be some combination of X and Y. So first of all, let's define equilibrium point. It's going to be a point which makes the derivatives zero. So you want the derivative of X to be zero and the derivative of Y to be zero. So to find the equilibrium point for a system, you just take the derivatives, you set them equal to zero, and you try to solve this system for X and Y. So it turns out that as long as, uh, you know, if you write this as a matrix equation, as long as this matrix of coefficients is invertible, then the equilibrium point is going to be this determinant is not zero, then the matrix is invertible and you can multiply both sides by the inverse and you see that the equilibrium point will just be the origin. So we'll just consider equilibrium points at the origin for the time being, sort of put our training wheels on, look at this, uh, the nature of solutions to the system of equations. Let's now write this as this matrix system of differential equations. You have your matrix in a little bit more compact form. Let's write, write this as the vector x prime. So it's a derivative with respect to the independent variables, say t, times a matrix a times x. So the bar over the x indicates that we're dealing with a vector of uh, uh, functions. These components are functions of the independent variable t. And the claim is that if there's a solution to this equation, it's going to look like so x is a function of t. And it's going to look like, let's try to find a solution in the form of some vector u, which we don't know what it is yet. And it's, it's a vector of constants times uh, lambda t. So let's differentiate this function with respect to t. And you get lambda when you differentiate the exponential. And again, u is a constant vector. It's just entry numbers, no, no functions of t. When you differentiate with respect to t, you're just differentiating that exponential. Now let's, we want x prime to equal to a times x. Computed x prime, it's equal to matrix A times X. So now we see that uh, either the lambda T cancel. We get that U, if you recognize from linear algebra, we have A times U is a, just a multiple of the vector U. In such cases, we, we say that U is an eigenvector of matrix A, lambda being the associated eigenvalue. So lambda mu is a eigenpair of matrix A. So this is uh, like when we assumed uh, for differential equations with constant coefficients, we assumed a solution of some multiple of e to the rt here, but here the multiplier is a vector. Apparently, to find all uh, solutions, we need to find, so any solution to this equation then will be in the form combination by linearity, we can find all the roots, uh, or we can find all the eigenvalues and for two by two, let's so just assume for now it's two eigenvalues. It's going to be, uh, so this is going to be the case when we have distinct eigenvalues, some combination of eigenvector times eigenvalue, e to the uh, eigenvalue times t, and we have another eigenvector with associated eigenvalue lambda two. So to find a solution in this form, our job is to find eigenvalues and eigen associated eigenvectors of matrix A. Now, when you compute, I mean, to find the eigenvalues um, of a matrix, if you recall, so here's an eigenpair, uh, lambda and u. You can re 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 write this as A u minus lambda u is the zero vector. Think of vector u as identity times u over here. Now you can factor out vector u. And the idea is that if a minus lambda i were invertible, then u would have to be zero. But that's not a, we want non-zero eigenvector. So we then would have to have that a minus lambda i is not invertible. That is equivalent to saying that the determinant of a minus lambda i is zero. Yeah, so we know that if 
course, if the determinant of the square matrix is zero, then that square matrix is not invertible. And so we can get non-zero solutions then for untrivial solutions for this uh, U. So that tells us exactly how to find eigenvalues. We compute this determinant of our matrix minus lambda i. It's called the characteristic polynomial of matrix A. We set it equal to zero. And then you solve for the for lambda, solve for the eigenvalues. And because we're only going to be dealing with system of first order linear differential equations, where we have two functions, uh, two equations, uh, A will be a two by two matrix. And so we know the characteristic polynomial is a polynomial of degree two. So we're going to have at most two roots, and the roots could be so the nature of these eigenvalues when you solve for the roots of the second degree polynomial is that the roots could be one of the cases, right? You could have real roots uh, and where, uh, and so the subcases would be well, both, the, we have distinct roots, where both are negative. We have distinct roots where one is negative, the other one is positive. We have the case where we have distinct real roots, both positive, and for real roots, we can always also have the case that uh, we have a root um, that's repeated. Uh, so you have a root of multiplicity two, the repeated root case. So we're gonna have, for the real root case, we're gonna have if you have imaginary roots, they're gonna come in a conjugate pair. Okay, and then we're gonna investigate the solutions uh, in that case. You can also consider two subcases where the real part is zero and then the case where the uh, the real case, well, let me just say this. Well, the real part is zero, it's negative, or it's positive. So the imaginary roots case, you can think of as having three subcases. What we're going to do is at our equilibrium points, where, you know, all of the, the derivatives of our functions are all simultaneously zero, we can describe the name of that equilibrium point looking at the eigenvalues and whether the real positive, negative, zero, repeated, imaginary, we can start classifying what kind of equilibrium point we have. So we're going to use start using, we're going to qualify the kind of equilibrium points we have as stable or unstable equilibrium, and then whether they, we have a spiral, a node, a center. Right? So we're going to throw these words around and find the correct phrases, the correct description of the type of equilibrium we have based on the eigenvalues. Okay, so we're going to have stable and uh, unstable. You also might hear asymptotically unstable or stable, less stable or unstable. And you also hear phrases like nodes or node, spiral, center. So these are the kind of words we're going to be using to classify equilibrium based on their eigenvalue based on the eigenvalues of the matrix. Okay, so let's start looking at examples. Let's go through these cases. A little bit too much theory, not enough practice here. It's just best to get into it. Also, there's something called a uh, saddle, which is inherently unstable. There's also something called a saddle, which is inherently unstable. And we'll draw pictures to see kind of uh, make sense of these words. We'll draw what's called a phase portrait of the two unknown functions. So let's look at the first case. We're going to get real roots. They're going to be distinct, and I believe, well, we'll see. So this is a case where the real root, we have real roots. They're going to be distinct and negative. Just so looking ahead, we're going to call this a stable. So it's a stable we're going to get a stable equilibrium at the origin. So remember that when x and y are zero, x prime and y prime are zero. So that's in uh, the origin is e equilibrium point. And we're gonna, uh, in the case of real distinct roots, where, which are both negative, we're gonna get something that's stable, equilibrium point, and it's called a node, stable node. So we write that as a matrix equation, and uh, the solutions are gonna base be based on the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. So let's find the eigenvalues. So that's going to be finding the roots of this characteristic polynomial. 
that is to say, finding solutions to the equation where the polynomial is equal to zero. Three minus lambda here, use quadratic formula if necessary. Here we can see we can factor. And so we have two solutions, two roots for our characteristic polynomial, lambda two, you can say is negative one. So you see those are distinct real roots, but both are negative. So next you find the corresponding eigenvectors. So we know they're gonna get, um, the eigenspaces for each of these eigenvalues are gonna be one dimensional. So we're gonna get a, a distinct, for each eigenvalue, you're gonna get a different uh, eigenvector, which is the basis for the one dimensional eigenspace. So let's find the eigenvector for lambda one. And the way we find eigenvectors is by finding a basis for the null space, we're looking for solutions to this equation. Eigenvectors are solutions to that equation. So we take matrix A, so we're going to take matrix A, and you want to find solutions to this equation. You want to find something in the null space of A minus lambda i, uh, where lambda i happens to be negative 3 for this case. So lambda 1 is negative 3. And we know how to solve such a system. We augment the matrix of coefficients with the right-hand side and row reduce. Now, by choice of by choice of lambda, this matrix is not invertible. So when we row reduce, we're going to get a, a, at least one row of zeros. So I mean, we can confirm that. But if you take row two plus two times row one in order to replace row two, you see that the last row is all zeros. And you can furthermore if scale row one by a half. So this is a shorthand for a system of equations. So this is the right hand side. You get three times u1 plus u2 is zero. So u2 is equal to the negative three times u1. So now we can may have many choices for such a vector. So you can let u1 equal to one. If that's the case, u2 has to be negative three according to our equation. So we found that for first eigenvalue of negative three, the corresponding eigenvector basis for our eigenspace is one negative three. We could have had other choices, obviously. So now we consider the next eigenvalue and find, find an eigenvector for that. So we're, uh, so we're looking for a solution to this equation. So we would take our matrix A and add the identity to it. So we take our matrix A, add the identity to it. And again, we want to solve for vector u, uh, which again, let's just find the null space of this matrix. And you know that if you found the eigenvalues correctly, if you do a row operation, the second row is going to become zero. First row represents a equation, namely two times u1 plus u2, zero. So let's say u2 can, is, can be defined as negative two times u1, which means that our eigenvector, let's say if we make u1 equal to one, then u2 has to be negative two. Let's pull this together, and we found that for our matrix, we have eigenvalues negative three with corresponding eigenvector one negative three, and another eigenvalue of negative one with corresponding eigenvector one negative two. So the the solution, the general solution to that equation is we have some combination of eigenvector times an exponential raised to the eigenvalue times t and the next eigenvector times the exponential. So that's a general solution. Next, what we're going to do is draw a face portrait and take a special notice of the equilibrium point at the origin. So we're going to take a special look at the equilibrium point at the origin. And what we're going to do is draw lines in the direction of the eigenvectors. So we have the vector 1, negative 3 we can draw a line through that vector. And then we look at the next eigenvector of one, negative two, and draw a line through that eigenvector, or in the direction of that eigenvector. So now imagine taking a limit. So okay, if you're at the origin, you're in an equilibrium point. But what would happen if you're slightly perturbed? If you, if you take uh, that point at the origin and you perturb it away from the origin. Right? So we're gonna be end up somewhere over here, say. As time goes on, what would happen to that point? In other words, what would happen if we took the limit as t goes to infinity? Well, notice that because our eigenvalues were negative, our exponentials are decaying, right? So as t goes to infinity, those exponentials will go to zero. So the whole thing will just go to the origin. 
So as time moves on, this point that had been perturbed away from the origin would, would move back towards the origin. In fact, that would be true for any point, right? So all our points, regardless of where you start, eventually, as t goes to infinity, you're heading towards this equilibrium. So uh, that would mean that, okay, not only do we have an equilibrium, right, but it's stable in the sense that if you knock off a perturb away from the origin, it would return back to the origin over time. So it's stable. And we call this uh, the or this uh, this equilibrium point at the origin a node. It's like you can also call it a sink, right? So that was in the case of real roots. They're distinct, but both are negative. So we might want to look at where we have an equilibrium at the origin, but we have say an unstable node. So this is a case we're going to get uh, for the eigenvalues. The eigenvalue matrix A, a case where the eigenvalues of matrix A are going to be real, but both are going to be positive. So real, distinct, but both positive. Then we, we're going to call this a unstable node. And we'll see why that's an apt description after drawing the face portrait for the solution. Find the eigenvalues of matrix A. So we're going to be finding the roots of the characteristic polynomial. We can factor. We found the eigenvalues to be 1 and 5, distinct real eigenvalues, both of which are positive. So next, we're going to find eigenvectors associated to each of those eigenvalues. For lambda 1, we'd be finding the null space of this matrix, spaces for the null space of this matrix. So you reduce this matrix, and you would get uh, negative 1, 2, 0, 0. So we get that negative u1 plus 2 times u2 is uh, equal to 0. So u1 has to be equal to 2 times u2. So we might as well make the eigenvector u1. So now we're going to find the eigenvector for the other eigenvalue in e5. And the basis for the null space of this matrix, we want to find a solution, a solution to this equation, a non-trivial solution. And by design, by choice of the eigenvalues, we know that one of the rows, if you reduce, is going to become a zero row. You get the first row times this column has to be zero. So u1 and u2 have to equal in this case. So let's have the second eigenvector be, say, 1, 1. So now we can write down the general solution to the equation. So it's some combination of the first eigenvalue uh, vector times exponential plus and the second eigenvector times its exponential. So now we're going to write down, draw a face portrait so that maybe we can illustrate why we would consider this case of real distinct but positive eigenvalues indicating a unstable node or equilibrium at equilibrium point at the origin. So this is the evolution of x and y as a function, as functions of time. So uh, as guide, guiding lines, we're going to draw lines through the two eigenvectors, 2, 1, and 1, 1. Now we look at the equilibrium point at the origin and pretend that we per, or get perturbed, right? So we move, uh, we take a point slightly away from the origin and see what would happen over time. So what would happen in the long run as t goes to infinity? Well, whatever happens, Notice that because we had positive eigenvalues, these are now, uh, these two exponentials are, they blow up as t goes to infinity. So we would move in the, away from the origin. So we'd move away from the origin, depending on like where we go, it just depends on the initial conditions. Right? So if you're at the origin, and x prime and y prime are both zero, so that's an equilibrium point. But if you're perturbed away from the origin, you would start moving away from the origin as time progressed. So it's a node, this kind of equilibrium is a node, but it's unstable, right? It's like getting knocked off top of the hill, you tumble down away from the top of the hill. Unstable node, distinct, positive, real eigenvalues. So now we're going to do an example of real roots for the characteristic polynomial, but opposite sign. So one eigenvalue is negative, the other one's positive. As always, the origin is the equilibrium point here, as it makes both derivatives x prime and y prime zero. 
we are first going to find the eigenvalues of our matrix. Setting the characteristic polynomial of the matrix equal to zero, we see that the eigenvalues are negative one and two. Next, we find, find eigenvectors. First for lambda equals negative one. And that's just the null space of the matrix A minus lambda I. And we see that's row equivalent to the matrix 2, negative 1, 0, 0. So in a good eigenvector would be 1, 2. Next, we find the eigenvector for lambda 2, lambda 2 equals 2. So that's just an, uh, a basis for the null space of A minus 2I. And that's row equivalent to the matrix 5, negative 3, 0, 0. So a good eigenvector would be 3, 5. So now we can write down the general solution as a combination of uh, a linear combination of the eigenvectors times the exponentials, the corresponding exponentials. Next, we can draw the phase portrait by graphing our eigenvectors from the origin. Draw lines through the eigenvectors. We want to draw some typical trajectories. And the key here is to see that uh, as we're coming from negative infinity, we're coming from um, the direction of the first eigenvector, the vector 1, 2. But as t goes to negative inf uh, positive infinity, then uh, we approach the line given by the second eigenvector, 3, 5, corresponding to the positive eigenvalue. We're coming from negative infinity to positive infinity negative infinity to positive infinity. So here we're flying by the this equilibrium point at the origin. So that's called the saddle. <clears throat> so when you have real eigenvalues where the signs are opposite, then we have a saddle for our equilibrium. Now we look at the case of complex eigenvalues. So for our system of two first order differential equations, uh, these complex eigenvalues are always going to come in conjugate pairs. So alpha plus i beta and alpha minus i beta, where alpha and beta are the real and imaginary parts. And it turns out that the corresponding eigenvalues are also going to come in conjugate pairs. So you're going to have uh, vector a plus i b. So here I'm going to assume that the eigenvector for lambda 1 is a plus i b in the following formula. So it turns out the general solution is going to be some combination here of the sine of beta t, cosine beta t, and the real and imaginary part of the eigenvectors. But the key part, though, is these exponentials, e to the alpha t. So you see that if alpha is negative, then asymptotically, as t goes to infinity, we're going to approach the origin. This means that the origin will be a stable equilibrium, or asymptotically stable. But because of the sine and the cosine, we also have some rotational motion. So we call this an asymptotically stable spiral. If alpha is positive, that is to say the real part of the complex eigenvalues uh, is positive, then we move away from the origin as time goes to infinity, so we call that an asymptotically unstable spiral. So unstable because we're moving away from the equilibrium point at the origin, spiral because of the sine and the cosine gives us a rotational motion. If alpha equals zero, then we have orbits around the origin. <clears throat> we call the origin uh, a center. The equilibrium is called a center in that case, if the real part of the complex eigenvalues is zero. Let's do an example of an of a asymptotically stable spiral. First, let's find the eigenvalues of our matrix. Setting the characteristic polynomial equal to zero and using the quadratic formula, we see that we have complex eigenvalues. It, ca it came in a complex conjugate pair. Notice the real part is negative 1, so it's promised that gives you a 
an asymptotically stable spiral. As t goes to infinity, we approach the equilibrium at the origin. Next, we're going to find the eigenvector for eigenvalue of negative 1 plus 2i. And that's also going to give us the eigenvector for lambda 2, because eigenvectors come in conjugate pairs. The eigenvector is just a basis for the null space of matrix A minus lambda i, lambda 1i. And it's, that's row equivalent to the matrix 1 minus i, 1, 0, 0. So a good eigenvector is 1 and then the negative of 1 minus i. So now I have the real and imaginary part of our eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1. I could write down a general solution if I wanted to. But the key point is that because of the negative real part for the eigenvalue, we have a decaying exponential. So as t goes to infinity, we approach the origin. Without being precise, the, uh, a typical trajectory would be some sort of spiral that would spiral towards the origin. So we have a asymptotically, asymptotically stable spiral. Now we look at an example of a system that gives you a asymptotically unstable spiral for the equilibrium point at the origin. Next we'll do an example of a asymptotically unstable spiral for our equilibrium point at the origin. We find the eigenvalues of our matrix. So we set the characteristic polynomial equal to zero and I get lambda squared minus 4 lambda plus 5 is 0. Using the quadratic formula, we see that the eigenvalues are complex conjugates, 2 plus or minus i. Notice that the real part of the eigenvalue is positive, so we get an unstable equilibrium point. So next we're going to find the eigenvector for lambda 1. So we find the eigenvector by finding a basis for a minus lambda 1 times i. And that matrix is row equivalent to the matrix 1 plus i, 1, 0, 0. So a good eigenvector would be negative 1 and 1 plus i. I broke that up into the real part and the imaginary part. I can, if I want to, write a general solution for this system. But the key observation here is that we have the exponential function, which goes off to infinity as t goes to infinity. So we're moving away from the origin as t goes to infinity. So now the face portrait, um, not being very precise, but a typical trajectory would be a spiral that moves away from the origin. So we have an asymptotically unstable spiral. Finally, we're going to look at an example of getting a center. That's when our trajectories orbit the equilibrium at the origin. We find the eigenvalues of our matrix by setting the characteristic polynomial equal to zero. And using the quadratic formula, we get that lambda is plus or minus 3i. Notice the real part is 0, so that we get a center. We find an eigenvector for lambda 1. So that's just the basis for the null space of a minus lambda 1i. That matrix is row equivalent to the matrix 1 minus i minus 6, 0, 0. So a good eigenvector one might be 6 and then 1 minus i. I broke that up into the real and imaginary part. If we wanted to, we could write down a general solution to the system. No notice the absence of the exponential because the real part of the complex eigenvalues was 0. So in a phase portrait, a typical trajectory would be uh, an orbit around the origin. So you see that our uh, trajectories are periodic because they're just multiples of sines and cosines.
So in this case, we call the equilibrium at the origin a center.